So welcome to After Dickinson and Disability, a panel from Poetry Wales. My name is Elizabeth Bradley and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Emily Dickinson Museum. I'm just going to describe myself right now. I am a person wearing a blue shirt with red hair and I am in front of the newly restored parlor at the Emily Dickinson Museum as my virtual background. It is a gorgeous room with a carpet covered and a basket of flowers pattern. There are bicolored blue and white curtains, a marble mantle, and some antique furniture behind me. And um, I am just delighted to be here with you and with this afternoon's poets. This week, we are bringing you 20 festival events that celebrate Emily Dickinson's poetic legacy and the contemporary creativity she and her work continues to inspire from the place she called it home. This year's hybrid festival has events happening on site and online, and we're just thrilled to have festival registrants from over 40 countries and poets coming to us from many countries as well. This afternoon's program will be 90 minutes. We want to encourage you to participate in the conversation in two ways. First, um, to ask panelists a question, you may use the Q&A feature to type in your question that's available at the bottom of your screen. You may also offer words of appreciation or thoughtful commentary using the chat function, which is in your toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Before we, be, we begin, please note that we have enabled the Zoom auto transcript feature, which transcribes speech to the best of a computer's ability. You may toggle this on or off by clicking the live transcript feature on your menu and then clicking enable or disable. During the reading portion, we will also be screen sharing the poems for you. And now I am pleased to introduce Zoe Brickley, who will be introducing the rest of our panelists. Zoe also organized an incredible panel for last year's Tell It Slant featuring environmental poetry, and we are just so happy to have her back. In addition to being the author of three books of poetry, Hand and Skull, Conquest, and The Secret, she has recently published two chapbooks, Abad After a French Movie and Verve Into Eros. Berkeley is an assistant professor in English at the Ohio State University, where she produces an anti-violence podcast, Sinister Myth. She won the Eric Gregory Award for the Best British Poets Under 30, was forward prize commended, and listed in the Dylan Thomas Prize. And now I will hand it over to you, Zoe. So glad to have you here. Great, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see you uh, and I'm very excited about this event. I just wanna start with a visual ID. So uh, I'm a white woman uh, with longish fair hair, red lipstick, uh, blue cardigan, silver necklace. Um, my background actually has um, the most recent issue of Poetry Wales, which is a red header, a pale yellow black, background. Now you can't quite make it out because I'm in front of it. It has a picture of uh, a kind of abstracted brain uh, with metal apparatus around it uh, and bees. And this was actually an artwork by Vivi Kapalan, who is uh, a Finnish artist based in Wales. We're really glad to have her. Um, there's also some text which is cut off slightly on the background as well, which says summer 2022 out now. And this is the issue that we're celebrating actually today. So I wanted to first of all say uh, to the Emily Dickinson House, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we're in part, as I said, celebrating the publication of Poetry Wales, its special issue platforming disabled writers, which I edited with Hannah Hodgson, who is a brilliant young UK poet who'll be reading today. As part of that issue, we had a conversation between myself, Hannah, Editor Taylor Edmonds and Cy Gillian Weiss, Weiss, which really illuminated for me the problems and possibilities for disabled writers. Uh, we also had poems by Claudine Tutungji and Samuel Tung, who are also reading today. So I'm delighted to be here, inspired by the memory and legacy of Emily Dickinson, who suffered from various disabilities throughout her life. One was related to sight loss, which she suffered, suffered for quite a long time. 
Other critics have speculated about mental health conditions or neurodiversity. Uh, Lyndall Gordon speculated in lives like loaded guns that Dickinson may have had epilepsy and other critics have focused on the end of her life when she was diagnosed with a nebulous label Bright's disease, though that diagnosis was a bit unclear. Um, Vivian Delchamp in her essay, The Names of Sickness for the Emily Dickinson Journal, suggests that though Dickinson did not seem to criticize doctors, she refused to grant omniscient authority to patriarchal medical science. When Dickinson encountered physicians, including metaphorical physicians, such as her editorial surgeon, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, she investigated the usefulness and ethics of diagnostic and surgical approaches to body, mind, pain, and disorderly forms. She often indicates, as in uh, many of her poems, that diagnostic interpretations of complex visceral experiences can be flawed and even dangerous. Uh, Vivian Delshaw focuses on Dickinson's poetic experiments with articulating pain, but could we find more than that? Delshaw quotes Michael Davidson's important essay, Cleavings, for Disability Studies Quarterly, and his note that Dickinson's poems might help us to understand lived experiences of loss, frustration, pain, and embarrassment. But she leaves out something important from Davidson's argument because Davidson draws on the idea of deaf gain. Reflecting on his own hearing loss, Davidson notes that for Beethoven, the harmonic and tonal complexities of the late quartets and piano sonatas were to some extent enabled by the cleaving produced by deafness. The politics of deaf gain move representations of deafness from sensory lack to a form of sensory and cognitive diversity that offers vital contributions to human diversity. I today want to ask the authors all included in our special issue if they could tell us about loss and gain and how that influences their poetics. The plan for today is that we'll have poems, a discussion, and then open for questions from the audience. We'll start with each poet reading a poem and talking initially to the question of how we resist a dominant narrative of loss. This means so much to me personally, as a writer who suffers chronic pain, and I've recently been coming to terms myself in my own writing with a retroactive diagnosis of quiet borderline personality, something that is highly stigmatized. I refuse, however, to accept that, and I'm seeking ways to correct people's misconceptions about the condition. All of these poets that we're going to hear inspire me so much in this mission, and I'm so glad that they're able to read for you today. So to start off with, let me introduce uh, Cy Gillian Weiser, a regular writer for the New York Times, uh, the author of The Amputee's Guide to Sex, The Colony, The Book of Goodbyes, Cyborg Detective, and a chapbook, Give It, Give It to Alfie Tonight. Um, Sai's actually at work on a memoir, which will be out from ECO, and Sai's work has been very important to me personally, a very defiant voice in challenging disability stereotypes, a trailblazer, a leader, a writer who inspires others, and I can't wait to hear what Sai has to share with us today. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, I am a white woman with uh, brown hair in a bun. I'm wearing a black Victorian lacy top with a high collar and see-through shoulders. I'm sitting in an office. Behind me is a Barbara Kruger drawing of Andy Warhol and my crutches. They look like regular medical crutches, except I have covered them in high gloss black tape on the top half. There's a bookcase to my right. As for gestures, I'm in and out of chronic pain, so I will occasionally be pulling at my neck or my shoulders. Um, I'm thrilled to join everyone today. We are striving for best possible access, so if at any point you have an access need, please do let us know. There are automated captions or craptions, as you might know them, available. If they are insufficient to you, please let Elizabeth know. Thanks to Elizabeth and Zoe and Hannah for bringing us together today, and I'm honored to be here. 
Zoe, will you share the screen? Is that what we're doing? Or maybe the screen is already, yeah, there we go. I'll begin with reading a Dickinson poem that I read as a disabled sex poem. Renunciation is a piercing virtue, the letting go, a presence for an expectation, not now, the putting out of eyes. Just sunrise, lest day, day's great progenitor out by renunciation is the choosing against itself, itself to justify unto itself when larger function make that appear smaller that covered vision here and i've been with this poem for 20 years now and i've written three poems called after dickinson 745 and my most recent interpretation of the poem is dickinson asking a sighted lover to please wear a blindfold because dickinson is quite frankly tired of fucking sided people here is the poem that i've written after 745 i'm not sure what happened in the room with the view except i took to you in a new way please wait i'm not finished let me be what's your word foolish now bring in the nay you never intended never meant it besides we have good god good lives without each other thank you so much lots to talk about there and so i'm looking forward to getting on to the discussion phase of things. But before that, we're gonna hear from our other wonderful poets. So let me introduce now, Claudine Tutunji, uh, who is an award-winning playwright, poet, author of Two Tongues from Carcanet in the UK. And I wanted to mention her bittersweet drama about a relationship sparked in an ocular prosthetics clinic, Slipping, which was selected for New York's Lark Play Center's International Hot Ink series. Uh, Two Tongues won the 2021 Ladbury Munter Poetry Prize. The poems have appeared widely and she's appeared at events, including Tongue Fu, Poetry East, and on BBC Radio 4. Hannah and I enjoyed her poems very much uh, in the submissions for uh, this issue. So I'll hand over to you. Thank <clears throat> thanks so much, Zoe, and um, thanks to Zoe and Hannah and Elizabeth, it it's really is an honour to be here and to be uh, talking to you in all your various locations. Just a, a description, I am a white woman with black hair, vaguely messy, slightly pinned up. Uh, I have a wardrobe behind me. I have a relatively attractive looking plant flower thing, which is actually fake. Um, and it's it's a white uh, a white door other than that with a black um handle uh so i'm just going to read two poems and um i think i'll i'll start I'm not quite sure what order they are going to come up aha right okay well let's start that way then <laughs> i was going to start with my short one but i will start with uh one that's called the swap and this poem um links to something Zoe mentioned, which was that I wrote a play about these, ha, stopped myself in my tracks because I was going to say I wrote a play about my experience of having an artificial eye, but actually it's a play, it's a fiction, but I drew on that and, uh, and then I also wrote a poem. So this is, this is that, The Swap. The eye stared up at you. It was your eye, naked, bargaining, painted on a shell of something white and hard. What dentists use for molds, they said, along with other words in cubicles, enucleate, sympathy reaction, orbital implant. The eye stayed dumb, but shone. And you felt it had some front, the gleaming fake with the upstart look. Too late to back out now. Too late to be let off the hook by this 
newfangled limpet way too late to undo the loss of your own strange planet, milky white, protruding, orbiting now only the afterlife, a uh, haze of blue ringing its rugby ball shape. In the absence of an eye, there is only a lack to be not looked into. Think of it as a gum, they said, but honestly, you'd rather not, and instead adopt celebrity tactics, headscarves, shades, no mingling with the masses, grateful beyond words for the eyelids' smooth discretion. When the day arrives, you confront the cool imposter, suddenly soothed by his chutzpah, his sheer darn polish makes you think it might work. It weighs like nothing, feels like nothing. You hold your breath holding the glass, meet your face as it once was in a photo when you were small, your smile shy, your ordinary symmetry. And then this is my poem that's in the issue we are currently celebrating, Pain. Is your pinup? Is your problematic third act? Is your personal trainer with a drink problem? Is your Krankenhaus quack? Pain is your cross patch companion who tells you you're not all right. Is your prophet? Is your quixotic knight? Thanks. Thank you so much. I just wanted to add something about screen sharing, which is that I um, wanted to remind you that it's quite easy to increase or decrease the size of the poem or the speaker by just dragging that white gray line, which is down the middle of the screen. So I just wanted to flag that up and remind you of that in case you hadn't experienced Zoom uh, too much, which seems unlikely, but uh, just wanted to remind you of that. Um, the next poet that I'm going to introduce is Samuel Tung, who is author of Sacrifice Zones, was poetry editor at the Glasgow Review of Books for six years and co-edited New Writing Scotland for three years. He also published three pamphlets, The Nakedness of the Fathers, Stitch and Hauling Out. Uh, in the past, Sam has written beautifully about the more than human, and I'm very interested to see this new turn in his work in writing about disability. Thank you, Zoe. Um, and thank you, Zoe, Hannah, and uh, for editing such an amazing edition of Poetry Wales and um, Elizabeth for the invitation to read and be part of this amazing festival. Um, so I'm uh, white, white male, uh, 40 something, I'm going to say, with um, short brown hair, which has been even shorter than it normally is because I had a fairly serious haircut yesterday. And I'm in my mother in law's upstairs room uh, in Germany, in the south of Germany, with some quite fetching mid century chest uh, shelves behind me. And I'm wearing a teal jumper and glasses. So this, yeah, this poem is written around um, a valley, the Lantony Valley in Wales. I think, Zoe, you're gonna screen share that one. Great, thank you. Um, exploring um, myodysopsia, which is um, where the, the vitreous in my eyes is, is kind of breaking down. So I'm trying to explore that um, in this poem. A few lines written above Lantony Priory with myodysopsia. And it has an epigraph of, from Psalm 121, lift up thine eyes unto the hills. Lift up thine eyes unto the hills and gaze along the debatable lands, spining the black-backed mountains and the wild ponies with gray smoke in their eyes. I blink whitely inside my vitreous brine. Lift up thine eyes, even the pocked and unsightly, the ink blotted and shadow spotted, imperfection is the eternal truism in this twisted holy valley, the screwed connection between landscape and the quiet of the sky. The cliches of ruins in their toothless anchors and my forehead pressed to the priory's pillow stone, the lost subsidies and the ewes protective as wolves. 
Behold, the tiny doors of wood and enemy and the corpse flowers in their hazel grates. The starry constellations of shadow that flick through a blinking orbit. My love for this place is why it pains me to be thrown out of it. I will lift up mine iPhone and edit out the haze for the blue, the green, the yellow. I want to see myself here inside the life of things. Look, I was here, share my looking, as clear as the first time. Half creating, half perceiving from the spectacular centers of my optic nerves. Now these eyes might be plucked, little eggs soft in the dike or puff balls come the rain. Seeing is a history, a memory and a spit paste rubbed from the good red earth. I want to see the ancient yew trees walking. I want vision as clear as the running of Afon Hondi from its gospel pass. Fertilizer speckled, an eye made quiet. No, the wind is on my right side, the burnt land sliding under my feet. I can taste the sun dropping and the gorse's desiccated coconut pricks my skin. The path tightens its way into my feet, crescents of hoof mud and takes me down to the valley floor. The mighty world of eye and ear, just a slashed hedge around the wet lanes of myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting formally that, and there's lots to talk about there as well. And so the last poet that I want to introduce is Hannah Hodgson, who is a young English writer and activist living with a terminal illness. Uh, she's worked with BBC Arts and Teen Vogue, received a prestigious Princess Diana Legacy Award, and recently published a debut collection, 162 Days. And I'm just so glad to be able to introduce Hannah because I was very honored to also be her editor for that book. And um, I just can't recommend it enough. Um, it's a, a, a letter written back to the medical establishment, which is really highlighting some of the deeply ingrained problems and, and ableism that is within that institution. So I'm delighted to uh, present Hannah here to you again today. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I'm a white woman wearing red lipstick uh, with pink hearing aids and earrings. I've cut my hair really short. I did it myself. I'm regretting it mildly. Um, just above my ears, it's brown and I'm wearing a floral pink dress. Um, just a quick note, another access note is that I'm currently staying in hospice just for some symptom management. I'm not feeling very well and there might be uh, some noises because it's, you know, a medical place. So I'm going to be reading uh, Mermaids on the Brain. Mermaids on the brain. I'm sorry to have to tell you this over the phone, but I've got your scans in front of me and I'm concerned that the mermaids we've discovered aren't receiving the care they need. Their scales are falling off. This can be very painful. All wounds should be bathed in salt water. Is there anyone at home who can help you scrape the limpets off their skin? Your girls are gravely ill, so they can't look after themselves. How often do you have an aura preceding your migraines? Gosh, that many. I'll refer you to a specialist in playing conch shells, it's important you don't pollute your brain with any petrol-like substances. This extends to pen, ink, glue from stamps and all decorative glitters. I'm concerned that I can't see any boats in either of your hemispheres. There isn't even the wreckage of one. Commence a course of nails once nightly, an hour before bed. Your subconscious will use them for the build. I notice you've swapped life rings for seals. 
Whilst I understand this is a temporary measure, their teeth are icebergs, bacteria lays dormant beneath gums. Don't let anyone get bitten, especially one of your girl. I note the fisherman gave you a final warning about the size of your nets. The hagfish can't breed at the rate you're killing them. Brilliant readings, thank you, thank you. And what a great way to set the tone for the discussion that we're going to have. Um, so I'm very excited um, to get these writers together. Um, when we were putting together the special issue, um, Sai, Hannah and I, and Taylor, uh, one of our other editors got together and had a conversation, a really wide ranging conversation, which I found really inspiring. So I'm excited to get us together again and bring in Sam and Claudine as well uh, on some of the questions that we talked about. And um, when I was thinking about Emily Dickinson again, and, and then also the conversation we had in the special issue, um, one of the things that impressed me about Dickinson was that um, she was fairly radical and that quite often she refused or made it very difficult to be examined by doctors, which I found quite amusing. I liked it rather a lot. You know, there's lots of notes from doctors complaining, oh, well, I couldn't really diagnose her properly. And um, one of the questions that I wanted to start out with is something that Sai, Hannah and I and Taylor talked about, which was, what is your relationship with doctors like? And how does that affect your writing? Because I think that this is actually something very interesting that we have particular ideas about doctors, about stereotypes, about who they are, and sometimes maybe some of the more negative interactions we have with them might be minimized in popular culture, mainstream culture. So would anybody like to start with that? Um, I can jump in if that's um, if that's okay. Yeah, um, I think this question is really important around the the language, the and uh, we we build things from language, and our poems are built from language. But obviously, medical um, language can be so ostracizing, but also quite interesting to explore as well. Um, and Hannah's work does this so well. Um, I edit one of the one of my other jobs is that I work at the Scottish Poetry Library, and we give a um, copy of a book called Tools of the Trade to every graduating doctor in Scotland. And uh, I really wanted Hannah's work in there because the idea behind it is that um, it's for doctors to um, have some space um, occasionally if they get time to um, read a poem that might uplift them or, or get a sense of um, peace and space in their busy days. But so much of what goes on um, in the medical establishment is language that um, just yeah ostracizes and and reduces people's experience and that's why I wanted Hannah's work in that anthology because she writes so powerfully about the experience of being at the end of um, a doctor's um, diagnosis or misdiagnosis or just incredibly um, soulless language so yeah, I think I just wanted to put that in there because I haven't had a chance to say thank you to Hannah for that amazing poem as well. Thank you. It was um, it was a full circle moment for me that actually because my favourite poet possibly ever, um, Julia Darling, was in a previous edition, and that was my top sort of I've made it thing in my head. And then when you emailed, I was like. God, it's happening. Um, so thank you. Um, I think, yeah, medicine is very weird in that obviously I need to stay alive, but I've also got to negotiate the personalities associated with that. You never know who that practitioner is going to be, what they're like. Um, we're trying to get an MDT together at the hospice. Um, with one of my specialists from my big hospital, um, the, the guys here, and my GP, and my other palliative care team. And it's been quite hard um, because everyone within uh, that group even are very concerned about stepping on each other's toes. And that's been a lot of the problem for me as someone navigating the NHS and just being disabled generally is that 
um, doctors and nurses and uh, carers incredible like generally especially in places like hospice amazing um but within popular culture um that we've just had a massive book in the uk by adam k um this this one's going to hurt i think it's called um and it's basically a book of doctor's bar stories and you know there's funny and there's there's sad and there's you know, um, those kind of things, but there doesn't seem to be quite the same space given for patients for stories. I think that's quite an interesting thing to explore going forward. And yeah, I always found with with medicine, you've got the medicine side, but then you've got the you've got you don't you don't know the person that's doing the medicine until you get there, until you get to know them. Um, that's been a big thing for me. Um, I don't know about you, Sai. Yes, that's resonating so much. The doctors are omnipresent. Um, and I was complicit. So I have a PhD. And for a while, well, for 15 years, I went as Dr. Jillian Visa. And just this summer in the New York Times, I changed my honorific and introduced a new honorific for anyone disabled. And you do not need a degree. And that honorific is Psy. I realized that I was born disabled. So I've been in this strange power dynamic with doctors for 40 years. And I'm quite frankly done with them. As far as using their very name in front of my name, that is no longer working for me. And so that for the first time feels victorious and liberating to reject the honorific of doctor to say, I do not want your name. I do not want to be associated with you in my own name and to discover a new gender ambivalent disability first way of creating an honorific. And, and also I just realized, wow, I've let my abuser be in my own name. Like why? And by my abuser, I mean the medical industrial complex, but I also mean the routine academic ableism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think sometimes we kind of, um, we're not allowed necessarily to express like the frightening aspects of interacting with doctors, that we have a lot of like narratives which are kind of uplifting doctors, right, and saying all the good work they do, etc. But there are also very frightening interactions. So coming at this from another angle, so from like borderline personality, was reading accounts from uh, psychiatrists of like working with borderline patients. And it's absolutely terrifying. It's scary. And it's something that I'm thinking about trying to write about. Because, you know, you even have like uh, psychiatrists writing things. There was one account where um, like the... The patient took like a, a pen from the doctor's office and he fantasized about crushing her hand afterwards you know it's, it's terrifying it's pretty scary um and and so you know i sort of wonder you know how we can sort of write back to that and i wonder if, if you've had any experiences around that claudine at all well i mean i, I you know i've had lifelong uh, glaucoma and and and, and many many interactions since since little and and, and I realized um lately obviously uh, you know spent a lot of time in waiting rooms and I was thinking around that and thinking about the quiet in hospitals and the use of language and and the sort of compacted pressure of that over you know anyone anyone as as many many here will know with chronic illness you know it, it, it's not just a thing it's it's a it's a life and so and I remember when I, you know, when I was, I don't know, when I would have started seeing this sign probably from about the age of eight to about mid-teens, please be a patient patient on the wall, right, in, in my eye clinic that I would go to. And, you know, I'm 46, so I, you know, I, I was with the docs from, you know, the end of the 70s to now. And I had the very scary consultants. I have to say, tracking it through, my, my feeling is, Things have got a bit better. Obviously, I've got a, I've, you know, only got a sort of uh, one aspect of my experience, which is 
uh, in, in glaucoma and, and corneal issues. These doctors are still scary people though. And I think that the, the, the idea that you only have this very, you know, um, constrained amount of time with them puts the pressure on your manner with them, on the way you could communicate with them. And so all of these factors that the please be a patient patient, the sitting in the waiting room silently year upon year, the learning to inter interact in a, in a specific way, in a way that kind of is not holistic in any way. It's all about one little aspect of you, in my case, my, my one seeing eye. Uh, it's got to come out somewhere. And where does it come out? It comes out in poetry, I think. And, and, and uh, that's not to say that I feel I'm always writing um, one narrative, but I think that the fact that I write is more and more, I realize as I get older, is linked to a large, you know, in a large part to, to that experience that I've gone through and I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm really interested in trying to break down how do we do this in terms of like how we actually write. And um, like Claire Mullaney writing in J19 suggests that poetry lends itself to writing about disability in Dickinson because both involve constraints. I'm wondering how helpful is that metaphor, that idea that, you know, poetry has constraints, disability apparently has constraints. And like, is that helpful or how, how do we think about how we write about um, disability? Do we have different metaphors for it maybe? I mean, it, it's, it's a big topic Zoe, but I, I, I think that there's something, you know, about um, the oceanic quality of being, with yourself in that intense way that I, I feel I feel a little bit like I'm speaking out of place here because I, I don't equate my experience kind of just say to everyone in the room because it's it's a lot narrower but I think any form of serious chronic illness you know I assume and from what the little knowledge I have you know it puts you back on yourself um, but that's not a bad thing that's a that you know destruction is creative I, I just think it opens up you know, s s such a deeper knowledge of of yourself, and um, anyway, it, it's a, it's a. I'm not going to waffle, but that's one thing I'm thinking around at the moment relating to this concept of constraint. Mm -hmm. And Sam, you looked like you wanted to add to that. Jumped in, yeah. Um, uh, just building on, yeah, what Claudine talked about with um, time and that the patient being patient and. Just thinking again, I think um, in the introduction to the Poetry Wales Sai and Hannah had a, an interesting discussion um, against the lyric and lyric um, ideas of time and wondering about, yeah, the chronic and chronos and then whether the time of a poem can help um, kind of kick against that chronic time in, in certain ways or even the capitalist industrial medical time that Sai you were kind of alluding to as well where um, you have a very set amount of a very short amount of time with a with a doctor or with a specialist or a consultant or whatever, but there's a different type of time that you can spend with a poem, spend with a um, language that you that you have to write with. Um, so yeah, I think that idea of chronos and chronic and how to write with time um, is quite interesting to to explore. Love that, love that. And how about Hannah and Sai? If you've got kind of particular gains that you get and not just this kind of like these kind of negative metaphors that we see sometimes yeah I I um constraint isn't something I feel especially when I'm in, a, in an environment such as this all the doors are automatic all the you know everything's as I need it and it makes me realize how inaccessible the rest of the world is and also I, I very rarely write in form if it happens it's an accident and um, I think form has been used and quite often is still used to exclude people and you know make poetry this thing that's something that you rip to bits when you're doing um exams that you um the poet means the blue curtains 
equals depression you know all these kind of just ridiculous things that are thought of um poetry isn't I don't think modern poetry is a form of constraint I'd hope that it is the opposite that certainly when we're talking about death and illness and these things we're trying to advance you know get away from being constrained because that's the way it's been forever um mm -hmm. and yeah it's I'm very much about the social model especially being here is where we realize oh my god it is the rest of the world's just really inaccessible who knew like <laughs> not me um yeah yeah interesting and this kind of puts me in mind is something that we talked about in our interview um a conversation wait can we slow down just a moment Zoe can we slow down just a moment because yeah. I love what um Hannah was saying about um not going to form or not going or not feeling constrained yes Hannah and I, okay, and I'm thinking that lots of this language is actually non-disabled poetics. I want to say first, I love Claire Mullaney's article. Okay, love it. So adoration for Claire's work. Mm -hmm. But constraint, limitation. The poem is so accessible, the poem is bad. Form above all, I was born as a deformed body. That's their language. Figurative language disfigured so there's this real tension uh when we are in poetics and i'm always wondering is this a non-disabled poetic term and usually it is and so then it's like what do i do with it how can i trouble it flip it where's the freedom for me how do i get unstuck from this language that's poetics but also has an ableist edge to it Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what I was thinking about with this and also with um, another article which goes back to the Vivian Delchamp, which was talking about how Dickinson might write poems as a way to express pain. And in a similar way, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable, similar to the, the kind of the idea of like constraints, you know, just this idea of is that all there is? Is that really all there is? Just expressing pain and that's it. And I feel like I wanted more. And I I, I wondered, you know, how you would feel about that idea of, you know, just perhaps, you know, a disabled poet literally just writing to express pain, because I, I feel like that's very limiting. And I wondered if you would agree. Well, I think it is. I, I think I think, well, I just think you when you whether you okay it's one I mean it's one thing to write an, an academic analysis of Dickinson but I mean first of all I write I, I have no idea what I write from I write I try to write as much as possible from my subliminal side from my oceanic self if you like whatever my psyche so yeah there's going to be like with because I'm human <laughs> But uh, you know, I, it's it's so reductive to just say that. But yeah, I don't know. That's my first take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to say to the the people attending as well that please feel free to add your questions in the Q and A. Um, if you have anything that you'd like to ask uh, the the readers, please put it in there, and we're going to move to your questions in a moment. Um, but I guess the last thing I was thinking about. Um, was this thing which we talked about in our interview, which I wanted to mention, which was this idea that Sai brought up, I think, which is of who are you writing for? And so like these, you know, different essays and takes on Dickinson are probably not written particularly for the disabled community. And um, similarly, um, I know that Sai was talking about how as writers, we probably go through phases where if we're writing about disability, we might start off writing for non-disabled people, actually. And how might that affect us? Who are we writing for? And are we writing for the disabled community or are we writing for non-disabled people? 
And I find that really interesting because I know personally, I think that that would really change like how you write, whether you have to hold someone's hand and try and explain to them like what it is that you're experiencing or if you can just kind of start at a certain baseline. And I wondered how you felt about that, about audience, who are you writing for? And who would you like to be writing for? I think for me, um, I have been thinking about this a lot since we had our chat um, with Sai. And for me, it made me realize quite how many studies there have been on, you know, patients writing their pain and how that improves or doesn't outcomes but it's never about a conversation between phys physician and uh, patient and it's not there's I've not seen any studies that have been on both sides mm -hmm. so this is how my life is okay this is my experience of that and uh, kind of a double a double thing because it's always been the patient and I have struggled with, uh, and I guess I'm also hopping back on the last question, uh, talking about my pain openly. I spent about 24 hours here just sobbing because we were talking about pain, they were asking every hour. And it's something I really try not to think about because I'm working all the time. And because I do some work for the NHS, they don't listen. I've always thought, <laughs> to hysterical women that has been my ableist internal like I cannot talk about my pain because if I do I will get upset and then they're not going to listen to me and then we're not going to make change are we and actually um talking about my pain and getting through that 24 hours of actually it's really radical and important to talk about pain um and build it into policies because you know waiting rooms say you're waiting for a doctor to for two hours ouch does that hurt when you're in, in a, a lot of pain um so there's honesty I think there needs just needs to be honesty on both sides that and there isn't that at the moment I don't think I think um there's a lot of fen um very honest and brave and you know kind of that's how um patient patient how our narratives are described and actually it isn't it's just another human and I think a doctor is just another human but there's this kind of status put on the the doctor memoir the doctor um assessment you know and actually who is the more important person in the room if we're looking at it like whose life is this um there's a lot of things that I think would really benefit just the establishment looking at it and going oh yeah this is about you it's not about oh yeah <laughs> yeah love that love that answer definitely and really kind of thinking about how we try to free ourselves from uh, having to write to a particular audience or to overcome ideas of whose stories are more valid seems really important. Does anybody want to add anything to that before I go on to like audience questions? I think we've got a few here and please do add them to the Q&A. I'm writing I'm writing now exclusively for cyborgs and not and and disabled people. That's my audience because I spent um, I don't know from 2007 to I don't know 2015 writing for non-disabled people, and then I had a radically transformative experience with fellow disabled poets and thought, oh, I've got to change everything. I don't care about non-disabled readers anymore and if non-disabled readers are into the work that's fine but they're they're no longer at the center and I think coming into community with other disabled poets was crucial for me because before that it was always me trying to appeal 
or make an appeal to a presumptive general audience, which is a non-disabled audience, a presumptive non-disabled audience, and then realizing this general audience is actually really disabled, 25%. And, and so it changed everything for me. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because I've been thinking about it too. And uh, I definitely feel like, so for me, with something like a mental health condition that's very, very, very stigmatized, how do you go about writing about that? Who are you writing for? And maybe it's better not to write to um, non-disabled people, actually, but to find, you know, a different kind of audience that you're reaching. So I, I just love that comment in the interview. And I think it's really liberatory and important. So thank you. Let's have a look at some of the questions that we've had uh, from the audience. So I can see, uh, let's send a warm hello to Anne Hardy Woodworth, who asked, how did Samuel Tung make his perfectly imperfect manuscript? What is his process? Um, it's not very technical, really. I, it was the joy of, um, the Microsoft Word, really, just putting um, images behind things. I, it's interesting in terms of this discussion about who it's writing for. I'm quite um, uh, early on in my uh, writing in in this kind of this kind of way, and just trying to think about. I think in this sense, I was trying to picture or uh, things for uh, a non-disabled audience, um, but realizing that it kind of fails. Uh, in multiple ways, um, as poems do. Um, but this one, because it's, when I was reading it, of course, I'm uh, reading it aloud and I can't um, actually communicate the, the um, imperfections in the, in the poem orally. It has to be visually. And then if that's a visual imperfection and people are visually impaired, then how do they actually engage with that? So I'm realizing almost instantly in this uh, seminar that it's a, a failure of a poem. But um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's part of the exploration of just trying to visualize or present what my um, ocular centrism is um, focusing on, for want of a better metaphor, and trying to just communicate that a little bit. But it was, um, yeah, the wonders of Microsoft Word. It's really intriguing to hear about. Thank you. Um, let's see who else has a question. So. Um, Warm hello to Caroline de Moriac, who asks, um, to Sai, can you clarify the meaning of the honorific Sai a little bit more? Yeah, so the honorific is just an abbreviation of cyborg, and I'm defining cyborg as first and foremost disabled individuals with a legacy back to Hephaestus as the original cyborg. I'm not a gatekeeper for the term insofar as uh, anyone who self-identifies as disabled may claim this honorific. So it doesn't require, a, you know, I have a computer for a leg, but it doesn't require that kind of technical computerized component. It could be someone who uses a wheelchair. It could be someone who takes antidepressants, thereby Importantly, the antidepressant or the pharmaceutical intervention is not the cyborg feature. The cyborg feature is our brains that are jostling between the pharmaceutical and whatever our brains bring to the identity. So it's an open term, it's new, I feel liberated by it. If someone else wants to use it, that's great. The only requirement, again, is that it discloses on your behalf that you have a disability. So anyone who is, for sociopolitical reasons, hiding disability or disabled in secret, this would not be the right honorific. Thank you. Thanks so much. And we talked a bit about that, didn't we, about the decision about whether or not you decide to disclose that you're disabled and how, you know, we really should be creating a space where people feel able to just talk about that. So I think that kind of ties into what you're saying there. Uh, 
But we have another question saying hello to Stevie Crayer, who says, can form in poetry help cope with po with pain, with pain? How can, can, how can it help cope with pain? And Stevie, you do say stop spilling it out, but I don't see a problem with spilling it out, honestly. But, but let's talk about form and like how it helps perhaps. Does anybody find form is something that helps you cope? I mean, I think if we're being honest, would you repeat the question, Kelly? Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Anna. Would you repeat the question? Yeah. So, can form in poetry help cope with pain? I was just going to say, um, if I'm being honest, it doesn't help. It helps get things out of me, or maybe explore ideas. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not a drug. It's not something that can help me escape my physical reality. It's maybe something that I can use to explore that reality, but um, it's not really a, a way of uh, stopping myself from feeling things or, uh, yeah. Again, back to that word constraint, it's not, you know, I've, I've done it for a while in various settings and that is not a fun way to live. And I think we should just be able to spill it. Nice, nice answer. Thank you. Thank you. I've got another question, which is specifically for Sai, and asks, how, where did you find a community of disabled poets, but I'm, I'm also interested in everybody else, like whether you found a community like that or not, but first maybe go into Sai. So how did you find a community of disabled poets? Um, I was really kind of um, isolated and I thought that my poetry was my politics and that I didn't need to do activism. And I now recognize this as non-disabled training in how to be a poet. Um, and so I went to OSU, uh, Margaret Price, who's the author of Mad at School, invited me to OSU. And I met her graduate students, in particular, the poet Kate LeBron and the memoirist, Jesse Mayo. And their radicality was so above and beyond where I was at. And I mean, I was a professor. So I'm looking at these grad students like, whoa, I need to catch up. This next generation is, is raising the bar and changed everything for me. Um, and I just hadn't been um, parachuted into a kind of radicality like that before. So after that, I changed my opinion and I thought that it's not enough. The poems for non-disabled audience are not doing anything for me. They're not actually pleasurable for me. Um, and I I now want to write poems to impress Margaret and Kate and Jesse. I want to write poems that attract disabled people to me. I don't care if non-disabled people are into my poems. Like, why would I care? So that was the, that was the point. That was the turning point for me. Great. And love, love all those writers you mentioned, for sure, definitely. Anybody else have any experiences with like, like Hannah, I know that you kind of are involved in a community where you are, and I don't know about Sam or Claudine. Yeah, I've just kind of found disabled poets out in the wild <laughs> and um, yeah, cling to them really. They, they we often have different opinions and it's just so great to be able to bounce conversations like these, just, you know, have this like ball going around the room and there's not knowing where it's going to go next and having that without having to even begin to try and describe all the other stuff, just that being a given, let's get to poetics is a wonderful thing. Great. And how about Claudine? Um, 
I I have sort of a tension between um, being in a, a kind of I mean I am in a community of poets in my town, um, but also currently going through a bit of a slightly more solitary approach to my writing. So I was always kind of in a workshop for a long time and um, have just I guess not in a Dickens Dickensian way because I'm not that much of a recluse, but certainly gone a bit in of late. So I've been working on my own. Uh, whilst at the same time, and still relatively recently, um, because I, I became severely sight impaired two years ago, um, socially interacting more with a, a great a bunch of sight impaired folk. Um, and so I guess I'm at that point where I'm just, you know, uh, I am sort of my, my identity is probably transitioning a bit because I have degenerative sight loss. But I you know, I don't, I don't identify as just that. So I write, I guess I still write from a whole mashed up psyche of, you know, and I don't sort of, I don't think consciously I am writing for this section of people or this, that section of people. Maybe I'm more egocentric than that because I'm exploring what's, what's here primarily. Um, Maybe that's why I'm not always publishing, Zoe. Who knows? But, you know, it's a journey. And um, I do have, nonetheless, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted to have, to have met via Hannah, really, a few people up in Cumbria, which is my mom's side of the world, um, that she knows too. And that's been a joy who are, who are writing from a place of chronic illness. And certainly having them as allies, um, who I get to see infrequently, um, but as frequently as I can, has, has also been really mind altering and and yeah it's a journey for me at the moment I'd say. Interesting to hear about and finally Sam. Yeah I suppose um, for me at the moment it's been seeking out um, individuals and, and also just um, realizing how many poets and, and friends of mine have um, visible and invisible disabilities um, and that they're already part of the community that I'm part of um yeah so yeah I've also been going through um uh, di diagnoses or non-diagnoses at the moment for um MS for multiple sclerosis so that might be linked with the eyes and things like that but um so uh, I've been seeking out and I didn't realize that one of my good friends and poet also has MS and um is doing a project on MS and poetry and things like that so um I think in a way I wasn't wasn't particularly seeking out um, a disabled community per se, but um, being much more hyper aware as I should be um, of the disabled and um, um, people within my community that I'm already a part of. So that's been very enlightening as well. Right, so just try, trying to like um, understand and, and open up like who's there in your community already. Sounds great, sounds great. So we've got maybe time for a couple more questions. Um, Susan Stinson, a warm hello to you. Susan asks, do you bring your poet's sense of language into medical settings? Do you code switch? Speak to doctors in a way designed to get to a practical result, then maybe go to the disabled community to consider the complexities of each interaction. So it's a question about code switching. How do we do, we do that in our interactions? Yeah, loads. I'll, I'll read the papers. I will like, you know, get all like bro with them and be like, hey, bro, medical bro, have you read this paper that like I've read? Yeah, cool. And um, they seem to light up when I do that. And they're like, oh my goodness she's read a paper about her condition um and actually a really really receptive and I find that I found that as a bit of a loophole I also find that quite terrifying because I do if I didn't have the resources I have you know and the time and the education so many people fall through the cracks because they don't know how to um say I read this paper here's this medicine let's try this I think I've got this can I have this test please all these things that you try and cram into that 20 minutes 
or however long the session is, um, are, I go in with a list and it's like most important at the top, least important at the bottom. And it's like, we, we are going in and trying to get each one and trying to get the letter to say a specific thing. So the GP will actually put that diagnosis on the system. It's all those kind of practical things that have to override the kind of um, the way I wish things were because it's how you stay alive. That's been my experience of it anyway. I've had to be like, oh, yeah, cool. I read medical papers for fun, apparently. But anyway, cool, yeah. Great answer. And I think probably a lot of us relate to that very much, very much. Um, just like maybe one more question from Jenna, Jenna, um, by Lara Gion. Um, do you ever feel the need to defend your making of art or poetry to the people in your life or even strangers um, as if they are allowed to dictate where you put your energy and or maybe tell you what is useful? Do you ever feel that like you have to defend your poetics and what you're choosing to write about? Maybe. I think that I don't defend it, but I, I feel there is a that I've definitely been on a journey where I'm aware of people would prefer me not to write certain things. But that's, you know, as a writer, and it comes back to what you were saying, Zoe, about um, when when you want to disclose whatever you want to disclose uh, um, certain aspects of your medical history some people might feel you know certainly family members might feel that uh, there's a stigma or whatever but you know that's the journey of a writer isn't it at some point you just decide well if I'm a writer I'm bloody well writing you know otherwise but it's yeah I I think definitely that's the pressure everyone encounters along the way probably it's a difficulty for sure yeah it's a difficulty for sure but I wanted to end by maybe just asking you if there was one thing that you'd like people attending to go away with, one thought, one idea, or one question, I wonder what it would be. And to give you time to think about it, I'll just flag up one thing that I've been thinking about that I would love um, to highlight. And I know I was talking to you about it um, just when we were in the waiting room before this event started, which is that um, a colleague of mine, Janet Ahmed, I was so impressed, works for a press called Lucent Dreaming and decided to just have a kind of grace period at the end of uh, submission periods, especially for disabled people who for one reason or another might not be able to meet a submission deadline. And I thought to myself, what a simple and wonderful thing to do which is just helping. Um, so I just loved that. And I'm, I'm always very open to any kind of strategies like that for thinking about how we can help and support each other. And I thought, yeah, what a wonderful thing to do. I'm going to adopt it for Poetry Wales for sure. Has anybody else got a thought, an idea, or something they'd like people to go away with from this event? I would like, um, well, specifically disabled attendees to um, try and fall in love with a with a disabled person, and if that's not really feasible, then I'd like you to try and fall in love or become enamored with an openly disabled public figure, because if you're having trouble changing the center from a non-disabled center to a disabled center. Sometimes the easiest way and funnest way to do that is through the beloved, who the beloved might be. Love that idea. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to send people away with. Anybody else got an idea or something they'd like to pass on? I think uh, something I would really appreciate is... Um, event organizers or attendees or anything like that just being really appreciative of time because I had something happen recently 
um, an organizer had sent me a number of emails and I hadn't replied to one. And um, as a disabled person who's really quite ill at the moment, that was really difficult to navigate. And it was another disabled person as well. Um, just kind of having open conversations and respecting the fact that times can be difficult, even if people aren't, you know, outwardly disabled, we all go through periods of disability within our lives. Um, everyone's in hospital at some point, everyone's got chronic conditions at some point. Um, and these things are really difficult to navigate and appreciate and um, kind of lessening the burden on those that you know are going through something um, would really help me. Um, I didn't mean to narrow it down quite that much, but I mean, just generally in life, there is a lot of crap that is really difficult to kind of do on top of everything else whilst being disabled and um even you know I if I <laughs> don't reply to an email which I haven't been for the last two weeks while I've been here because they've been like no you're on holiday no and I've still been replying to a few emails but not as many and it's been a really good thing for me to just sit and watch some bizarre program on Netflix that I'd never even considered watching before um, and giving myself a bit of a holiday. I haven't had a holiday in probably about four years and that in itself is not a very healthy thing. So just kind of considering yourself and considering others and thinking about, you know, what you want to do with your time and what others might want to do with their time. Yeah. And I think it's strange how people can't really sometimes um connect the dots in that so you know you you know you're kind of hired to be like a disabled reader and yet then you don't answer an email and there's a very negative response to that it's like strange that kind of disconnect and um and I think it's what Sai says it's moving the center from like a kind of a non-disabled center even for everybody actually because we're trained to think that way we're trained to situate ourselves that way um how about Claudine? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, just totally echoing Hannah, just to say, I, uh, you know, yes. And I'm sort of trying to send you a virtual hug because I just think it's so crazy how the tempo of everything is so hyper. We're at warp speed. And especially now, it's it's mad that people want to, to you know, these quick turnarounds on things. And forget, we all do it, but we all forget to sort of just pause and breathe and think, hang on you know, A, that person may be, we don't even know what they're going through right now. And everyone's a little bit traumatized because of the pandemic. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm right on board with what Hannah just said. Um, just on a tiny thing relating to site issues, um, I would love for there to be, and I, don't, I haven't thought about funding models or anything, that more poetry books are done as audiobooks. And even just more magazines, if they could, and I know most magazines are on a bit of a shoestring budget, have, um, you know, audio of the poems, if possible, because it's just so wonderful when you can get, uh, you know, access to, to stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not even a, a blind person, but I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, stuff. And, and whenever I can get, you know, it's, it's, it's whenever I can get access to that writer that I'm desperate to read and I can't really read for pain issues or for whatever issues, if they're available on audiobook, it's a delight. It's also very, very different, isn't it? Um, I heard someone do a really great, it's just on the dreaded Amazon, you know, sorry to mention it, but a brilliant recording of Frank O'Hara, which totally changed my understanding of him because it was, it was done like jazz and anyway I won't go off on one because I know we're on a time constraint but what I'm saying is more audio please in every possible space thanks I realize that's a bit anti-deaf as I just said that so 
<laughs> but you know, I'm talking from the, the site issue. Yeah, do you just kind of mindfully saying, don't forget about this? Which yeah. Is important too. Yeah. And then how about Sam? Yeah, all of those points are, are brilliant. And yeah, more audio. Um, falling in love with more people is always a good thing. And um, thinking about time again, yeah, coming back to that idea of time, my, yeah, my friend, um, this is not my um, idea at all, but um, uh, I, yeah, I'll say Georgie Gill, my pal who, um, who works in with MS and poetry calls it um, MSE time. So yeah, with messy without the E, but making sure that we're much more aware of how messy time is and how, yeah, how difficult it is to keep to capitalist, hyper-capitalist time constraints. Um, and in fact, there's more MSE time going around than, than, we, than we are not aware of. So yeah, and also that there's no transparent eyeballs. I was reading some Emerson before we came on um, and his thing on being a transparent eyeball and there's no such thing. So yeah, no such thing as transparent eyeballs is another point I'd like to make. <laughs> That was an unexpected turn, honestly. <laughs> but uh, I, what I would say is that I, I just really appreciate you so much. And I, I think you're all very inspiring. You're very inspiring to me. And um, I hope that maybe this conversation could be part of a journey for us all in kind of moving towards like supporting each other with, with better accessibility, learning from each other and trying to make everything we do as accessible as possible. Um, so thank you so much for your work, uh, for your wisdom, and for the conversation. It's wonderful. I'll hand over to Elizabeth, who just wants to say a few things before we end, I think. Well, thank you, Zoe. And wow, thank you so much, all of you. Um, I am so grateful for all that you shared and your wisdom and the community that you brought together here today. And based on the comments in the chat, I know the participants and the audience are as well. So on behalf of the Emily Dickinson Museum and the 2022 Tell It Slant Poetry Festival, I wanna officially extend our appreciation for this panel of poets, Zoe Brigley, Sai Jillian Vaisa, Hannah Hodgson, Claudine Tutunji, and Samuel Tung. Another important group that I'd like to thank are our sponsors at the Beverage Family Foundation, People's Bank, and Mass Cultural Council, as well as all of you who have made a donation in support of this free festival. We couldn't do this without you. And if you are able to join the ranks of those who support us, you will have an opportunity after this Zoom webinar closes, there'll be a donation link that will pop right up. And there is more festival to come. Tomorrow through Sunday, we are gonna be bringing you more poetry programming, both online and in person. The full schedule and information can be found online on the festival platform, Sketch. So it's not too late to sign up for more programs, including this evening's headliner event with Taimba Jess and Sumita Chakraborty. Tomorrow's a workshop on the Dickinsonian death-defying exclamation point and the conclusion of our poetry marathon. We'll put the link to the program platform in the chat right now. And now, uh, thank you again and take care of yourself, everyone. Farewell. <laughs>